this small lunch lunch segment together in honor of Earth Day. We have our special guest, Tashiana Carter. I'll read a brief bio about her in a little bit, um, but I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. My name is Brittany Brown, and I am the serving currently serving as the secretary of the Women with a Mission chapter of FEW um, at PBGC, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. So again, thank you for joining us. Without further ado, let me introduce Ms. Carter. Tashiana currently serves as the Associate Chief Financial Officer of Acquisitions at the National Labor Relations Board. She has been in federal acquisitions for 11 years and has a seven-year-old son. She first gained interest in gardening as a child through stories of her family working in the tobacco fields in North Carolina, Carolina and the joys a child has running through dry cornfields. She eased her way into gardening a year pre-COVID, experimenting indoors before becoming the aspiring mini farmer that she is today. Her property is now home to banana trees, grapevines, buzzing bees, and a host of edible and non-edible plant varieties. I've known Tashiana for a little over 15 years, um, and she's actually taught my son a little bit about gardening as well. I'm not an outdoors person, but he loves it. <laughs> so. I will now turn it over to Sashiana. Uh, the presentation, the link to the presentation is in the chat. If you cannot access it, I'll also put my email address in there and we'll try and get it to you um, after, after we finish with this segment, but it will likely have to come to your personal email if that's okay. All right, Tashiana, it's yours. Hello everyone, um, thank you for having me. And uh, without further ado, so um, in our, our short session, I'm going to kind of cover a, a broad overview of topics from zones and guidelines uh, when planting through planning and organization and then plants. And of course, at the end, we'll have questions, but feel free to stop me anytime you uh, want to ask something. All right, so the boring stuff. Um, the USDA plant hardiness zones is kind of the, the governing um, uh, information or policy, if you will, for uh, gardeners and farmers. So uh, what it is, is a, essentially a bunch of zones that they came up with and they kind of label all of the plants, uh, whether they are edible or um, non edible uh, plants. Uh, to let you know whether or not it's going to actually do well and grow well and give you whatever it is that you desire, whether it's something you know, like flowers or if you're looking to grow food, um, the plant zone map helps you understand if that plant will survive. So take for instance, um, I live in Maryland um, and I live in Southern Maryland and I believe my zone is 7 uh, which means that there are some plant varieties that uh, will not thrive outside. Um, those varieties would be like citrus trees. Um, if I put my citrus trees outside of a greenhouse and just leave them outside all season, they will definitely die because of harsh frost conditions um, in Maryland. So the way that you can uh, find out what zone you're in, you can visit uh, the Farmer's Almanac, or you can go directly to USDA's website, or you can Google the um, plant hardiness zones, and you can find out exactly you know, what zone you are in, um, so that you aren't out buying plants uh, that, you know, won't survive in your yard, because nobody wants to have to keep replacing plants, um, and I'll get into the difference between annuals and perennial plants later on in the presentation. So this is just a, a tidbit about zones. Um, you can find zone information on uh, most of the back of the plants. Um, they have usually have like tags in them that tell you how to grow them and they should have the zone information on there. If you happen to be in a nursery or even Home, um, Home Depot or Lowe's and you see a plant that you like but you aren't sure whether or not it actually will survive in your zone, the good news is that most local uh, um, places that you can buy plants from typically only have plants that survive um, in your area unless you go to specific nurseries that actually have fruit trees um, and you have to check those to make sure that they'll survive in, in your location outside of being indoors or in a greenhouse. 
Did you know that just because a plant may not do well in your zone does not mean you can't still grow it? So I have citrus trees, like I mentioned before, and even though I can't put them outside in the ground like I would love to, I have a uh, two greenhouses. I have a smaller one um, that is uh, made out of metal and a uh, type of plastic that allows light in. And then I have a cold frame greenhouse that is covered in a white plastic type material that allows light in. Um, my citrus trees reside in my greenhouse only with heat to kind of maintain that environment to make them feel like they're in Florida 24-7. Um, I also grew uh, a mango tree from seed. And with mango trees, you can start them indoors. But um, what happens with a mango tree as it grows, it won't produce fruit inside of your house because the conditions aren't right. So essentially you can grow anything that you want to regardless of what zone you live in. It's all about mimicking the conditions that, that help that plant thrive. So you can have greenhouses, you can create a mini greenhouse in your home uh, just for a plant to survive. So don't feel limited just because you might live, let's say in Maine or you know wherever that's kind of colder than uh, the more Southern states. Now, moving on to garden uh, designs and guidelines. So there are a variety of ways to uh, grow food or flowers in your uh, garden, whether it be indoors or outdoors. So I'll start with outdoors. The typical methods you see with outdoor gardening um, revolve around in-ground planting, uh, you know, some people have beautiful landscape jobs with flowers and shrubs, and while others have more of, you know, pure grass, uh, straight trees, and that's pretty much it. Um, you can also grow in a greenhouse, like I mentioned. The greenhouse actually in, in this presentation that's uh, pictured in the third picture under outdoor is one that I own myself. Um, it works pretty well. It's uh, a great size for someone just starting out. Uh, for me, I've kind of outgrown it. Uh, so it's a little tight and I need something larger, but it definitely works well. You can use it heated or not heated, um, totally up to you. The way greenhouses work is they circulate air, they use light, um, to, it traps light and heat within the greenhouse itself. And if you want to kind of learn the science behind a greenhouse, feel free to Google it. I am not a scientist, so I won't even begin to try to explain that to you. But essentially it traps the heat inside and keeps your plants from uh, experiencing uh, negative outdoor temperatures. The other way is container gardening. So you can use any type of container you want. There is um, a lady and I believe she lives either in Georgia, maybe North Carolina, somewhere in that area. And she has a garden full of clawfoot tubs. All of her clawfoot tubs um, house her plants. Uh, she has beautiful collards and I'm talking about really big uh, vegetables um, that you would typically see if you plant it in the ground or if you own the farm. So don't be afraid, you know, you can use any type of container as long as there's like drainage holes. That's the biggest piece with container guarding. Um, they also have fabric bags now these days that you can get off Amazon. You can probably get about uh, uh, 10 in a pack and it just depends on what size uh, container that you want. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a plastic container or a clawfoot tub. Um, it can literally be uh, fabric and and it hold up pretty well. Uh, I have seen people also use Ikea bags um, or any type of reusable bag that kind of stands up and holds uh, the weight of soil. So you can be creative as, as much as you want when you're gardening outside. Indoors, you know, it, it just depends on the space that you have. So the biggest piece with indoors is having a light source. So whether you have windows or you have grow lights, you can grow indoors pretty much, uh, I would say about anything. Um, I have uh, experimented with growing indoors. Uh, the third picture in the indoor section is a indoor greenhouse. I have one for my seedlings. So when I uh, grow my plants from seeds, I typically start inside the house and in this greenhouse, 
um, to, to make sure that my uh, seedlings have the appropriate environment to flourish in. You can grow, um, now they have these, these neat contraptions. So I don't know if you all are familiar with like Aero Garden and some of the other uh, hydroponic systems. You can uh, find them on Amazon. You can Google hydroponic systems and they'll all come up. Uh, the garden towers, I think, are the latest, newest things that have come out. So if you didn't want to have like a big box in your house, or you just simply don't have the space, you could go with a hydroponic system and still achieve the same results. Now I will say with hydroponic uh, garden systems, you won't be able to grow certain things. So root vegetables, um, like take for instance, carrots or potatoes, those type of, of plants you can't grow in a hydroponic environment just yet because well, to be honest, it'll rot. You, you know, when you have something that's waterlogged and it's a root, it's not going to do very well. So you typically see your vegetable plants, um, such as like, uh, you could probably try growing peppers, although the weight of them could uh, cause them to, to break on the hydroponic system. But you'll see more like of your lettuce, your greens. Um, some people have been successful with strawberries. Uh, growing on these particular towers and in hydroponic systems. Herbs are also a great uh, um, plant to grow on these systems because they kind of like to be in a constrained environment and with adequate water and light, they do very well. Okay, guidelines. So North or east facing gardens um, typically get the most sunlight. Now I do caveat this with your property is going to be different than your standard guidelines. So what you should really do is pick a spot that you want your garden to be in and, and watch the sunlight. It is important that your plants get adequate sunlight. Um, so you want to pick the spot that has the most sun for the most hours of day so that you really get a, a great harvest if you're growing vegetables or if you have flowers that typically prefer sunlight, you want them to, to get the most out of what the environment has to offer. Your shady uh, type of plants that you know enjoy being shaded, you can plant those in, in either a shaded area or near trees and, and uh, hedges because they, they appreciate the more you know part sun, part shade type of environment. Now your plants that grow tall should be kept away from plants that require direct sunlight. So for example, you wouldn't plant your corn plants next to your okra because okra likes sunlight. Um, for starting seeds indoors, uh, you, you typically should always start them indoors, to be honest. Unless they're things like corn, um, you can start beans outside if you wanted to. Your root vegetables outside, onions outside. There are typical plants that you don't necessarily need to plant indoors to start them. Um, it's more of like your tomatoes, your peppers, uh, some flowers you can start inside. Um, if you are one of those individuals who loves a, a beautiful cut flower, uh, flower garden, you definitely should start those seeds inside because they have a little bit of trouble uh, growing when you just scatter seeds outside. Um, use the farmer's almanac. Uh, I would say it's probably my best uh, friend when it comes to understanding when the last frost is. Uh, so you don't want to plant your indoor seedlings too soon outside because of course the frost will kill them. And like right now we're in that faux spring time frame where you think it's good and you put your plants outside and then next thing you know frost hits and I'm probably experiencing this right now right now I'm in Tennessee but I know um in Maryland it's uh, a little it was a bit cold so I'm hoping that you know um because I'm eager and anxious I put my watermelon seedlings outside because I'm just so excited hopefully they survive and I don't have to start over again um, okay, so to save money on dirt. So dirt is, is, it can be costly, especially if you have like a big yard that you're doing, um, or if you have several containers that you're trying to fill, or even raised garden beds can, can take up quite a bit of dirt. 
Um, I am not even going to attempt to try to say the German name um, because it's going to sound very funny. <laughs> but essentially, this method is is a way to not only build up the nutrients in your soil, but to save your, your, your dollars for other things like maybe more indoor plants or seeds or what have you. So uh, this particular method, you put down a layer of cardboard. Now the purpose of the cardboard is to block out whatever is underneath. So if you have a raised bed that um, is directly on the ground, like it has no legs and no bottom to it, You'll put the layer of cardboard to cover up if you was putting in an area where there's grass uh, to keep weeds from coming up. Um, you can do a layer of fabric. Um, I believe it's like the garden fabric that is it's uh, breathable and water can pass through it. I don't necessarily recommend that because it keeps worms from uh, getting into the soil and you actually want the worms to come in. Now the cardboard does kind of prohibit that a little bit, but it breaks down over time. So um, it's not as prohibitive to uh, healthy bugs in your garden. So you put your layer of cardboard down, then on top of the cardboard, you will add like sticks and branches, small logs. So if you happen to cut a tree down or you're cutting limbs, save them, put them in some obscure place. Um, and then you can add them into your uh, raised garden bed when you're ready. Or even if you happen to be planting in ground, you can still apply this method. Um, so you put your, your wood debris in. And then you add in your layer of leaves. If you um, have grass clippings, you know, we like to cut the grass and, and usually uh, the grass is caught in a bag. Keep that grass because you can add it into your soil mixture. Um, Compost and manure, of course, manure, of course uh, definitely help with uh, creating a healthy soil for your plants. Um, the, the benefit of this is decomposing material feeds nutrients into the soil that your plants need. Um, you know, so you won't have to buy fertilizer as much when you do uh, this type of thing. And then finally, you want to put a, a layer of topsoil and then you can plant your plants. So that's essentially the, the, and this is a part of what's called permaculture. Um, permaculture is another form of agriculture, if you will, where you're not tilling the ground. Um, you are just merely placing things on top to help the environment. Um, and they, there's different ways to do that. Uh, there's a lot in permaculture. So if you have time, uh, definitely look it up. It's a, a very eye-opening um, topic and you'll learn a lot with that. Okay, so, you know, there's this whole thing about gardening organically um, or even organic foods in general. I will caution you that, you know, not all things that are labeled organic are actually organic. If you read uh, the ingredients on something and you're not sure what it is, it is likely not organic. Um, so avoid common pesticides. They will actually harm your garden uh, and, and they could essentially get into your system and you don't necessarily want that. So if you um, have non-friendly garden bugs and you can see on the right hand side, there is a very ugly worm that is the bane of my existence. It's called a hornworm and hornworms will destroy your entire tomato garden um, in a blink of an eye. And, and they uh, are adamant about eating everything. So to help combat that, you have a variety of organic uh, type of pesticides, if you will. So the first one I'd like to mention is neem oil. Um, and in these presentations, the links are clickable. I try to uh, at least guide you to the right brands, um, the ones that I am mentioning. So neem oil is, is amazing. You mix it, it comes in a concentrate. You mix it with a little bit of dish liquid and warm water, and it helps keep most uh, pests away. Um, I will say that you're constantly going to be spraying neem oil. So in addition to that, the All Seasons brand horticulture and dormant spray oil, um, basically uh, those two together will help keep uh, some of the bugs that will destroy your plants out of your garden. Uh, so those are definitely helpful. They're organic. 
Um, you can't go wrong with them. They're not gonna you know, put anything in your body that isn't already there. Um, another way to keep pests away is companion planting. Um, you can find more information on companion planting on uh, the Farmer's Al Almanac, or you can Google companion planting. There's like a wealth of information on the internet. Um, an example is uh, the herb borage. Um, borage, you should plant next to your tomato plant. So in my garden, I have a row of tomato plants and then I have a row of borage and then I keep going because I'm an avid tomato eater. I enjoy salsa. So I have a lot of tomato plants and a lot of pepper plants. Um, but planting borage basically helps it hornworms do not like borage. They can't stand the smell of it. So when you have something that's stinky to bugs next to their food, they won't typically, you know, go that way. Um, also, when you are doing companion planting and you're unsure of how to use uh, the plant that you're planting, um, definitely Google it. Borage uh, was used in uh, traditional medicine uh, back in the day when traditional medicine was important and all that we had. Um, you can use it in food dishes. You can make drinks with it. It makes, it has like a pretty blue flower. Um, so it's not like one of those uh, funny looking plants like lamb's ear, you know, they kind of give you the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> and by the way, lamb's ear does uh, help keep deer away. Um, so they don't like the texture of it. So you can plant it around your garden and they'll not, you know, mess with your plants. Um, use natural fertilizers. That is important. So the two brands that uh, have really good results that I use are Dr. Earth and Down to Earth Organics. Um, it's important to understand what fertilizers you're using because sometimes you can use miracle Grow and it's not exactly what your plant needs. Uh, so when you're, if you really want to get into gardening heavy, uh, do some research and, and learn all that you can about what exactly you want to plant. And that way you're best prepared for the gardening season going forward. And you're not you know, wasting your money on something that isn't going to benefit the food or the flowers that you're trying to grow. Okay, so seeds go a long way. I am probably a seed hoarder. Every time I see seeds, I'm like, oh, I need this. And I probably have maybe you know, too many varieties of, of beans or watermelons in my house, however, um, you know, they last for a very long time. So typically when you buy some seeds, you, you won't have to buy them again, uh, and, you know, for a few seasons, unless you're growing, you know, a lot of food at one time. Um, you can also collect seeds from your plants. Uh, so I'll give you an example of what happens when the weather changes. So right now, um, with the fluctuation in our temperatures uh, in Maryland, um, I have kale plants and collards that are still outside and they're, uh, you know, pretty much growing and broccoli. And with the, the heat that we had in, on certain days, it kind of uh, shocked the plants. So now the plants feel like, oh, it's the end of my life cycle. Let me flower and, and go to seed and die. So when that happens, you're, sometimes the, the plant itself, like the leaves become a little bitter. Um, I do have a rabbit, a pet rabbit for my son, so I'm not too concerned about the bitterness in the leaves. Also, it depends on your taste buds. Some people say that these leaves, so they, they'll say like the kale or the collards are, will be um, bitter. However, you know, it, it didn't really taste any different to me from, uh, you know, when it wasn't going to flower. So you can collect seeds from your plants when they do that, when they flower, you just wait for the flowers to drop and then you watch those stems and you'll see the seeds kind of come through. You can also watch YouTube videos on that. Now, if you don't want to collect seeds, you know, the, the farmer way, there are plenty of, of companies that have uh, seeds for sale. So I listed a few that I purchased from um, that have really good germination rates. Like you're not going to buy seeds and then they not, you know, uh, sprout unless, you know, you yourself might be doing something wrong or the seeds, it just could be a bad batch. But uh, these particular places like Seedville, um, Melanated Organics, Baker Creek, all of these were really good. Um, the dollar store, surprisingly, their seed offering, it isn't um, expansive but you can get things like chives and, and beans. 
Um, I think they have cabbage. So they have like a, a good uh, a healthy mix of vegetable plants. They even have flower seeds as well. Now I'm experimenting with their flower seeds to see how they turn out. Um, but they have a, a really nice selection. So if you're just starting out and you don't want to spend a lot of money, go to the dollar store. Uh, it's, it's great. They have a, a great offering there. Um, for prices with seeds, they'll range. Um, if you're buying online, let's say from Etsy, uh, from one of the, the, the vendors who sell seeds, those prices are going to be different and fluctuate. They could be on the high end, depending on how many seeds you're getting. Uh, some of the companies offer like seed packages. So if you're interested in growing an herb garden, they have a um, herb garden packages where you get a variety of herbs. Some of you probably never heard of and may need to do a little research on what you could use it for. Uh, but there's uh, basically it's endless possibilities on the internet. Just do your research and read the reviews uh, before you buy. And if you're unsure, you know, you can message the vendor um, whether it's a, a large scale vendor like Baker's Creek, or if it's a small time business on Etsy, you can always find out more information. And you also don't necessarily have to start from seed. Uh, Lowe's and Home Depot and Walmart um, have plants already uh, up for sale. They started as soon as spring hit, they had their, their plants out. I was in there probably every day buying everything that I wanted. Um, they have everything from basil to tomatoes to cabbage, um, peppers, and they have a, a huge selection. So if you haven't already, uh, definitely check that out. Um, so when you are starting seeds, you do not use regular soil for that. Um, you need a seed starting mix. So the problem with regular soil is that it is too thick. It's heavy. Um, there's a lot of things in there that seeds just don't need right off the bat. So uh, you can go to any particular um, store like Lowe's. You can go to nurseries. They have seed starting mix. Uh, Tractor Supply, if there's one near you, has a, a bag. I want to say it's probably like $6. Um, but they have seed starting mix. It's really light and airy. It's great for uh, the seeds to start to grow in. You can use peat moss. Now at Lowe's, they have this really big uh, bag of peat moss. Um, typically, it lasts me all season and sometimes into the next, depending on you know how much I decide to grow. Uh, but peat moss is a great way to start your seeds as well. Now, uh, to test seed viability, so let's say you had some seeds and they have been around for a very long time. You don't even know when you brought them. Just take a few out, put them on a paper towel, um, that a wet paper towel at that, not super heavy, but damp, put it in a plastic bag near a sunny window, and then check it every now and then to see if they sprout. If they do, um, if majority of them sprout, then you're, you're pretty good to go. If none of them sprout, um, or even if less than half of them sprout, then you probably need to go ahead and buy a new pack of seeds. All right, planning and organization. Okay, so supplies and materials, I tried to kind of give you a list of things depending on how you want to grow. And this, you know, can go for flowers, um, it can go for vegetables, whatever it is that you desire to grow. You can even grow trees. They have tree seeds. I'm interested in buying seeds for um, a red sugar maple uh, because I would like to uh, tap those trees for um, their uh, sap to make syrup. So uh, you can grow pretty much anything anywhere. So starting seeds, I'm not gonna read this list. You can kind of look through it yourself. Um, I will say with the light source issue, um, for seeds, it is important that they get adequate sunlight and even sunlight. So what I mean by even is um, if you put them in a window and you don't rotate them. Like, so you should probably rotate them maybe every other day once they start to sprout, they will get leggy. And what I mean by leggy is you'll see that they, they start getting really, really tall and they look stressed and stretched thin and then they die and you don't want that. So um, in those cases, you really gotta monitor how much light that your seeds get. The easiest way to combat that is with grow lights. Um, when you're first starting your seeds, uh, you have to put your grow lights maybe about three to five inches above 
uh, the the seed itself, well, the um, container with the this the peat moss and your seeds in them, and you keep it there until the plants kind of reach up to the grow light, and then you raise it some more, and that kind of keeps them from uh, growing too fast to try to reach the sun. You never want your seedlings to chase the sun, so that's my my tidbit on starting seeds. Um, everything else is kind of self-explanatory. Of course, you can always reach out to me after the presentation and get my information from Brittany. And if you have questions, I'll gladly uh, will walk you through that. Okay, layouts matter. All right, so when you are gardening, um, when I, well, I would say when I first started gardening, I just kind of grew everything. It didn't matter what it was. I had okra, I had pimento peppers. Um, I had corn in weird places. I was just all over the place because I was just excited. Uh, it becomes a, a really, really hard to manage. And also, you know, when you, it, it's all about trial and error when you're gardening, you end up finding out that some things just don't work with others. So make sure you have a, a visual representation of how you want your garden to be set up. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, I have this elaborate, gorgeous garden, all of the, my boxes and containers are, are neatly put like, you know, garden the way that you see fit, but make sure you know where your plants are and, and what can go next to them. Um, so I have put here and you can click on these pictures and it should take you to the link, hopefully, as long as technology is my friend. <laughs> Um, these different websites, they uh, have garden plans that you can either print off or you can do on uh, the computer. You can design it and print it off. Um, it's a great way to stay organized uh, and, and, and keep yourself from planting too many things because that, that can also be detrimental to your garden as well if it doesn't have enough space. So make sure that you take the time out to figure out where you want things to go so that when you're outside, there isn't a question of, well, how do I want you know, this to actually be laid out? Um, and then if you're not into doing it on the computer and you're a phone person, there are apps. I am a uh, Apple user, so I do not know what's available for Android users. But if you type in garden planner um, in your app search, if you're an Android user, you will definitely come up with some options. Here are uh, some of the available options on um, uh, the Apple App Store that you can use. You just type in a name and it'll come up or you can type in Garden Planner and you can see all of the apps that's available. Um, I, there are some that are better than others, but it all depends on your preference. Okay, tracking. So what you're seeing on this scene is uh, this screen is my uh, uh, basically one of my uh, sheets on my Excel spreadsheet or workbook. I am a, I try to be very organized, um, especially when I'm starting from seed because sometimes uh, when you start from seed and it doesn't work, you want to notate why it doesn't work. And um, what I found is that like some of the seeds that I have, uh, don't typically like some of the, the soil or there's too much heat or too warm in my greenhouse. So this was an experiment for myself to see how things go. I also like to keep track of how many seed packets I have and what brand I have um, them from because I do have like a, a very extensive seed catalog and, and you know, I I'm not a fan of buying things that I already have. Like if I have, uh, let's say chamomile already, I don't need anymore. And I think I have maybe like four different brands of chamomile. So it helps you prevent yourself from buying more than what you need of one particular seed variety. And, and others, you know, like it, it can give you information on days of maturity, um, especially on the backup packets. Now, sometimes uh, if you order from some companies, they don't give you that information. So you'll have to go and research it. Uh, but most of the time that information is there. Uh, it's tracking, it can be written down. It doesn't have to be on a computer. I just happen to live on my laptop 24 <laughs> seven. So it makes it easier. But uh, I did find that writing things down and, and keeping track of things helps me understand what I'm doing, what works, what doesn't work, uh, because gardening, honestly, and farming in general is trial and error. 
you, you know, uh, you get information passed down from other people who have been in, uh, you know, the farming or the garden industry for a very long time. And there's nothing, you know, concrete written down unless you're going to read books. And most people don't really have time to, you know, really read books on the topic that they're uh, interested in hobby. And so you end up doing trial and error. So definitely write down what works and what doesn't because it'll help you in your future gardening uh, seasons. All right, indoor plants. So these are, let's say, um, this kind of goes for uh, non-edible and edible uh, gardens, but mostly this is for your, your indoor plants that you love, like your birds of paradise plant, um, or if you have, um, really big leafy ferns um, or a uh, fiddle leaf fig plant. It, you know, this is kind of information for that because I realized that not all gardens um, have to be edible. So for your soil on your indoor plants, they can often be attacked by pests. Um, one of the brands of soil that uh, typically carries gnats is miracle Grow. So don't put miracle Grow in your house. If you're repotting your plants, it will drive you bonkers trying to get rid of those gnats. Um, so replace your soil with what's called Lika. Um, it's like a, a, a lava rock, if I understand it correctly, or you can replace it with rocks. Your, your indoor plants will be just fine. Um, they won't mind it. Uh, and, and you'll notice that there's no gnats in your house. If you want to keep soil, add a layer of cinnamon on top every now and then, and that kind of keeps certain uh, pests away. Um, fertilizer, you want to fertilize your indoor plants in the spring and in the, at the beginning of fall. Your plants have like a growing season on the indoor, uh, indoor side. They know when it's spring, they know when the weather changes. So you wanna feed them at the beginning and at the end of their growing season. They're usually dormant during fall and winter time. So you don't need to fertilize them during that time period. Leaf cleaning. Your leaves need to be cleaned every so often. So I know sometimes we just water our plants and we go on about our business or we even forget to water our plants. And then we come back and we're like, oh my gosh, I killed it or it's, it's on the verge of death. Uh, make sure that every once in a while and, and check them maybe like once a month that your leaves are, are clear of, let's say, dust or, you know, just anything dirt can get the, on them, what have you. Uh, plants need their leaves to, to, to really be cleaned so that they are able to uh, do photosynthesis and survive. Um, it, sometimes dust and dirt uh, prohibits photosynthesis and that can kill your plant. Uh, so make sure that your leaves are clean. You can use neem oil um, with cinnamon to clean your leaves. Uh, what I found is that neem oil with cinnamon helps keep what's called red spider mites away. So if you ever noticed on your leaves that there's like, it looks like cobwebs around some, some of them, they're not very obvious, like you really have to look close. Those are red spider mites. Um, and the way that you can get rid of them is using neem oil and cinnamon and, and you have to do it every so often because um, I tell you they come back with a, a vengeance and they can actually harm your plant if, they, if there's like an over infestation of them. So make sure you're, you're kind of wiping your leaves down every now and then and making sure that uh, there's no little cobwebs uh, from the little red smite, uh, spider mite friends. Uh, light source. So uh, your plants, of course, need sunlight to flourish. Some need less light. Um, some need filter light. Uh, so make sure you're you're doing a little bit of research on what type of plant that you have, so that you aren't placing a plant that you know thrives in low light in a direct light environment, because that will kill it. And um, at the towards the end of the presentation, there's a, a few books that I have. Um, that I'll recommend to you all that kind of give you some insight on the, the type of plant varieties that you can have in your house and how to take care of them. All right, outdoor plants. Okay, so soil, we'll start there. If you have poor soil quality, um, meaning that like nothing really survives, or if you have more clay than you have uh, regular just soil in general, you will have to amend your soil. 
So what I mean by mend is you are going to add things to it to help make it fertile. So that's like compost, manure, fertilizers, and, and healthy soil mix to kind of get, uh, get you going. Um, one of the really good brands uh, for soil is Fox Farm Soils. You can find it uh, in nurseries typically or on Amazon and I think even Walmart. Um, the internet, of course, has everything. Um, but if you want to go pick it up, uh, definitely check your local nurseries. They typically carry it. Uh, really great brand. They incorporate a lot of nutrients in it. And from what I've seen, I haven't had any gnat problems with that brand. Um, so if you wanted to use it on indoor plants, you definitely could. Fertilize, well, fertilizer. Um, your growing vegetables have to be fed. So you have to make sure that you are regularly feeding your plants fertilizer. Um, you can look at whatever fertilize, uh, fertilizer brand that you decide to use. Just look at how often you should be fertilizing them. They have different types of fertilizer for pretty much every type of plant you could think of. Um, you can start out by getting a fertilizer that kind of covers a broad range of plants so that you're not buying a fertilizer specific for everything. Um, now, if you are a fruit tree person like I am, I have peach trees, I have apple trees, I have a plum tree, um, those type of tree, I have citrus trees, those type of trees, you need to make sure that you're getting a fruit tree type of fertilizer. Um, and that will uh, benefit them the most. Plant protection. Now, if you live in the forest like me, you have a problem with deer. Uh, last year, um, it was a trial and error season for me and I had some cabbages growing and I had watermelon vines kind of flourishing. I was so excited. I had about four watermelons that I could see on the surface that were starting to develop and come through. And what do you know, the deer decided they wanted my cabbage. And, and, and this was in an area that I didn't even think that they had the ability to get to. Well, they definitely ate my cabbage and crushed my watermelon vines in the process. So I lost all of my watermelons last season and I was devastated. And now I'm on a mission to keep the deer away from my plants. So I have developed a, a really kind of big enclosure and so far so good. I haven't had any problems, but essentially you want to make sure that you're, you're keeping your plants safe. Um, so you can use the repelling spray. It helps. It just, you have to remember to spray after the rain or every so often because it does kind of dissipate. Um, you can use cattle panel, tractor supply has that, you can use chicken wire. I have chicken wire up around T posts to keep uh, animals out um, and it's been successful so far. So definitely protect your plants. And of course for pest control, neem oil, all seasons oil and diatomous earth is great. I will say that diatomous earth is very messy. Um, you will look like you've been playing in flower. <laughs> but it helps deal with beetles, um, any other type of bugs like aphids uh, that like to eat your plants up. Um, it, it helps, but you also have to keep dusting and that can be kind of annoying and, and messy. So uh, use the oils, they kind of work uh, a little bit better than the earth. Uh, crop rotation. So um, when your crops kind of come to their end of cycle, make sure that you rotate to another bed to kind of give your, your soil different nutrients or, or plant types. Um, it helps build up the soil for future generations of gardening. So definitely rotate your crops. And I have a sample uh, uh, crop rotation chart that I pulled from one of my books. Um, that you can kind of use in your own uh, gardening methods to uh, uh, make sure that you're rotating your crops. I believe there is some information on uh, the Farmer's Almanac, Almanac <laughs> website. Uh, so definitely check that out. They have a wealth of information there, um, but this will kind of get you started. All right. Uh, plant flowers in and around your vegetable gardens. That is so important. So your vegetables um, need uh, pollinators. And if there aren't enough flowers nearby, the pollinators might not necessarily come and visit your vegetable plants. 
Now these particular flower uh, varieties that I have around in this uh, slide are edible as well. So you can do a variety of things with them. Um, you just need to look up to uh, look each plant up to see what you can do with them if you're interested. I do know that with violets, you can actually make a simple syrup with that and um, it's actually uh, used in teas. So uh, please do some research on flowers because they are also beneficial to us, um, even the ones that you think aren't like daylilies. I had no idea that uh, daylilies are actually eaten in China. Um, so that was actually interesting. And here we have book resources. So I am probably a, a lifetime student. I love to read. Um, check these books out. Uh, the one in the middle, How Not to Kill Your House Plant. That book is probably really beneficial to anyone who loves house plants more than they love like gardening in general. Uh, there is, I believe, information on a variety of plants that you could have in your home, um, or at least something close to the plant variety that you might have. And um, it helps you take care of your plant. It tells you about what pests usually uh, attack your house plant. It tells you how often to water it, when to fertilize, what, uh, how close it needs to be to the window versus how far. I, I found that book to be a great resource for my indoor plants. Um, the Week by Week Vegetable Gardener's Handbook, it has a, a wealth of information and some templates for you to use. Um, so if you wanted to keep track of things, you wanted to journal, you wanted to learn about what to do each week of the gardening season. So it starts from when you uh, start at seed all the way through the end of the life cycle of your, your, uh, your plant. It's a great resource. Um, the Encyclopedia of Herbal Medicine is a wonderful book on herbs. Um, a lot of the things that we use like garlic, uh, and chives, and it even goes into lemons and bananas, uh, can be used for other things than, you know, just typical consumption or using it uh, to cook your food. So if you were interested in on the more of the herb side, I do recommend that book. It's a, a great resource uh, to have in if you want to read up on things. And now I, uh, any questions, I will stop talking and rambling and answer any questions that you all might have. Tanisha, thank you so much. It was such a great presentation. You're really good at presenting this. It's like you must be an encyclopedia <laughs> of plants and growing. I, I love to garden and right now I have a porch. It doesn't have a roof, it faces west. In the morning, it's shaded, but for the rest of the day and the evening, it's really sunny. So I don't think I can put a tomato plant in a pot out there because that's what I've always done. I too love tomatoes and I live in the city and I would grow them in pots. But um, I don't know, do you have any suggestions on a vegetable that I could grow out there? I would say um, probably do herbs. Uh, I have herbs. herbs in the windowsills, but I haven't put them outside yet. Yeah, you can try. I believe uh, the the what's supposed to be the last frost is, uh, should be happening this week, and you should be able to put them outside by next week. Um, so try your herbs there with the tomatoes. You, it's more going to be like a trial and error. So place them out there and see how well they do. If they look like they're okay, then just leave them there. Um, if they look like they're maybe uh, turning a little yellow on the leaves, they probably aren't getting enough sunlight and you'll need to put them uh, in a different place and then you can um, put them back into the, the place that you had them originally. So what I do with some of my plants is if I don't have space where there's adequate sunlight, I will move the plant to another location and just let it sit there during the day. And then when the sun goes down, I just put the plant back. So you yeah. can try that method too, um, to get it more sunlight. But for the most part, I've grown tomatoes in, in shady areas and in, in well sunlit areas. Yeah. And, and you can tell a little bit of a difference, like you might get more 
um, harvest out of one plant than the other, but they still pretty much do uh, very well. I live in the forest, so I have really, really tall trees um, and, and not a lot of sunlight all the time. And my tomato plants pretty much uh, thrive. I had a lot of cherry tomatoes and a lot of, of beefsteak tomatoes last year. So they should be okay. Just watch them and see how they do. Now, if I try to start a, a tomato plant outside and I find that it's just too sunny for it, will it grow inside if I move it inside by a window? It sure will. You can definitely grow tomatoes inside. So wow. um, just make sure you're getting sunlight from the window and it'll just be, it'll be just fine. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, good afternoon. I didn't know if anyone else was going to go. This is Italian Townsend. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was an awesome presentation. <laughs> um, I wanted to say, I wanted to ask when you mentioned about Miracle Grow, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. When you mentioned about Miracle Grow, uh, I just want to make sure I heard you correct. Did you say that will actually draw in uh, well, because you have gnats and the flies? Yes. So Do you, <laughs> I'm laughing. Is, is, is I use it faithfully and I didn't know why <laughs> the net. So thank you for <laughs> Thank you, you for are that. Very welcome. Miracle Grow will bring gnats in your house. Um, the soil carries the gnat eggs. So if Miracle Grow is the only brand that you can get access to, leave the bag outside in the sun. Just just let it sit for the whole week. And and what happens is the heat that gets stuck into the uh, the bag of dirt will cause the gnat eggs to kind of uh, deteriorate. And then you can bring it inside. So that's like a form of sterilization. Okay. Uh, there are people, and I, I don't, I have not done this because you just can't get me to put dirt in my oven. That's just not happening. I draw the line right there. But there are some people who will bake their dirt before they put it in a planter. So that is an option if you are interested in baking dirt. <laughs> I don't, I can't give you any information on that, but I do know that there are people that do that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I didn't know about the Merrill Gro Grow soil, and I bought some for the first time. And sure enough, I had these gnats flying around. And at Ace Hardware, I got these. Can you see these? These I are can. like little, and you put some sugar. They give you everything that you need. It's like sugar water in it, and it attracts them, and then they go inside. And um, I got rid of them. Uh, yes, you they, you have to use so many methods to get rid of those gnats. They're like never ending. And then some of them are, are not like your regular gnats. They're called fungus gnats. And you're like, what what is this? And why are you here? And they just get on your nerves. So you end up trying to use a variety of methods, setting off the bombs in your house, you know, what have you to kill them all. And they still come right back. So my recommendation is do not buy miracle Grow. <laughs> not <laughs> again. <laughs> Any other questions? Right. I have one more question. I, I was trying to get somebody else <laughs> a chance. Um, so for normally every year for my home, I have two big pots that sit on the front porch and I normally go to like Lowe's or Home Depot or like Walmart and buy the plants. You know, you, they have them like six, like an annuals and annuals and different types of flowers like that. Really pretty colorful flowers. So this year I decided instead of buying the flowers that I would just buy the seeds from uh, like Lowe's. And um, do you, I, I do see where the greenery is coming up from the flowers, but do you know if if you if you say for instance that they say if you plant them you know right after you buy them and if you don't plant them in a certain time if that flower will still bloom or if you miss the mark of when you plant them will it not grow? Um, so it it really depends. Plants are fickle sometimes. Um, 
I know that on the packages, it'll say that you should plant by this date in order to get flowers, let's say by June. Now, if the, the conditions are right with the weather, it, that plant's gonna bloom regardless. It doesn't matter if it's June, October, it's gonna do what it wants to do. So I wouldn't necessarily be too worried about it. I will say that starting from seed, it takes patience. So you could have a bunch of green leaves and not see a flower until next year. Um, okay. With annuals, you know, those don't come back. So if you want to keep them, bring those pots inside or put them in the garage somewhere where it's it's warmer than you know outside temperatures and then you won't have to to start all over the next year uh but yeah those it seeds and 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 flowers and how they operate they are fickle i did plant some seeds for flowers in my yard just to see what would happen i got leaves and then i thought that i wasn't going to get a bloom and next thing you know i think it was probably about late October, I ended up getting a few flowers and then they died. So it just depends on, on how that plant is feeling and what the environment like is like at the time that it decides to bloom. Okay, thank you. No problem. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Your presentation was amazing. Thank oh. you. So, so, so much. Um, on behalf of Women with a Mission Chapter of Few, I want to thank everybody who attended today. Um, I'm pretty sure you all picked up some good, wonderful tips. I sure did. I mean, I kill plants left and right. So that whole leaf cleaning thing, I'm going to have to um, definitely look into that. Thank you so much for all the resources that you provided, those books, the apps. I'm definitely going to go download some apps now. Um, but really mostly thank you for your time. No problem. It was great speaking with all of you. And um, if you need any assistance, feel free to get my information and I'll gladly help you out. And thank you for the neem oil. I had not heard of that. So it's on my list of things to get. You are very welcome. <laughs>